week I shared with you about how people can cry out to the Lord, even if they have little faith, and the Lord can and does respond by doing amazing things. That is true. God does big things, even in response to little faith. Now, my word for this week is to put alongside that, because it's another aspect of what can happen when we cry out to the Lord. And so we come to Paul's thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know with certainty what that was. It's often been assumed to be referring to some illness that he was suffering from. Well, that's possible. I don't think that's what it means. For three reasons. Firstly, in the Old Testament, thorns are sometimes used as a metaphor to refer to hostile people who were causing trouble for the Israelites. In Numbers 33, uh, God says, If you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your side. They will give you trouble in the land where you will live. And whilst there are occasional references to Paul suffering medically or emotionally, there are many, many more to his suffering, persecution and opposition. And that's the way the word is used in the, in the Old Testament. Secondly, I am sure that in the way Paul tells the story of his thorn in the flesh, there is a parallel with what Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was going to face the most serious pain inflicted on him by other people. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed three times, If it is possible, let this be taken away from me. Just as Paul says, he prayed three times that God would take this thorn away from him. Incidentally, thorns are part of what Jesus experienced in his suffering, aren't they? He put a crown of thorns on his head. But most significantly in understanding this is the fact that in this very passage, when Paul ends about talking about his weaknesses, he says in verse 10, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. Those are the kinds of thorns in the flesh he's talking about. He's talking about facing trouble from other people, oppression from other people, persecution from other people. I'm pretty sure that's what his thorn in the flesh was. However, whatever it was, it is clearly speaking of something that Paul was finding very painful and he thought was going to make him less effective in the work he was doing. Less able to serve Jesus. And so I'm going to share a few things about his thorn. Whatever it was. The first is this. It was serious. We are not talking about something trivial. Paul says he pleaded with the Lord. That it be taken away from him. The phrase in verse 7 that this thorn was sent to torment me. The word that's translated torment, it's used a number of times in the Bible. That's the only time it's translated torment in, in the NIV. It means literally to beat with fists. And it's sometimes translated as that. Paul is saying this thorn was sent literally to beat me up. He was being beaten up. Maybe physically, certainly that's how it felt. It's the word that Paul uses in chapter 4, verse 11, when he says that the apostles are brutally treated. It was serious. Secondly, it came following remarkable spiritual experiences and visions. Fourteen years ago, he says, he was caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things that no one is permitted to tell. 
Paul had had amazing experiences of God and visions of heaven. That is very, very significant. Because struggling with thorns in the flesh, things that make us painfully aware of how weak and vulnerable we are, is not just something that happens to those who are living at a higher spiritual uh, It's something that doesn't happen to people living at a higher spiritual level. It happens to the great saints as well. Paul was having these amazing visions of heaven and at the same time was feeling painfully hurt by things that were happening to him. Can I say to you, in the name of Jesus, if you feel you're suffering from some kind of weakness, pain that you feel is limiting you, it does not mean you're a second class Christian. Paul was not a second class Christian. But he had his thorn in the flesh. Here's the third thing about it. It came from Satan. He calls it a messenger from Satan. Literally an angel from Satan. In other words, it was something sent by Satan. In some way or other, the devil is behind what was happening Paul. And to Paul, I think that would have suggested that it was intended as something that was meant to put him off being able to serve God's kingdom effectively. The devil's trying to stop me being able to do what I'm called to do. And yet here's the fourth thing. Paul clearly came to understand that God was sovereign over what was happening to him. Because when he pleaded with God to take away this thorn in the flesh, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength can still be effective. He says it's made perfect even while you're still weak. God is actually sovereign over what is happening. God did not send it. God does not send pain and trouble. But sometimes he doesn't remove it. He works in the midst of it for a good purpose. Nothing that may be happening to you or any believer in Jesus today that is making you feel, as Paul said he felt, beaten up. Nothing is outside the sovereign plan and work of God. God does not send but he works in the midst of them. And that takes us to the fifth thing, that God used Paul's thorn in the flesh for a good moral purpose. He says, it was to keep me from becoming conceited. Do you know the problem with having great spiritual experiences with God? They can make us proud. They can make us proud. I've had great experiences with God. And people can even start to think of themselves as obviously better than other people who haven't had the kind of experiences that I've had. And God says, I'm sorry, I'm not allowing that. To keep me from becoming conceited. God will sometimes allow things to happen to us that will keep us humble. Keep us humble. Remind us that we're not head and shoulders above other Christians. We're still fallible human beings. And yet God can still do good things for us. But he wants to keep Paul humble. Satan intended this thorn simply as a way of attacking Paul. God allowed it to continue for a positive purpose to help Paul's character to develop. You remember when Joseph met his brothers at the end of the story of Genesis? 
he says to them about the time that they sold him into slavery, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You see, what makes the difference to how we, th- uh, you know, how things affect us, bad things happening to us affect us, is not what happens to us, it's how we see it. Do we see it just as a problem? And therefore, if it doesn't go away, mm, I've got a problem, and God hasn't taken it away. <clears throat> or do we start looking for what can God do in the midst of the problem for his good and for my good? And that takes us to the sixth thing, that Paul did pray earnestly for God to remove this thorn. He says, three times I pleaded with God to take it away from me. It is never wrong to pray for God to remove trials and troubles from our lives. Even Jesus in Gethsemane prayed, Lord, Father, if it be possible, let this pass from me. It's never wrong to pray for God to remove troubles and hardships. However, however, seventh thing, God's answer was not what Paul had been hoping for. God answered, but not in the way that Paul originally hoped. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul almost certainly thought that the hardship he was experiencing was not just bad for him, but would limit how well he could serve Jesus. And God says, no, it won't. No, it won't. The greatest lesson of this passage for us is that troubles that make us painfully aware of our human frailty, our human vulnerability, are part of the experience of even the greatest saints of God. And even though such troubles do not always disappear as quickly as we might like and pray, God can still continue to bear good fruit for his glory through us, even while we're still going through the troubles. Now that could be, for you, for any one of us, either an amazing encouragement or an awful disappointment, depending on how you see it. Let's say we find ourselves living with circumstances that are hard, that make us feel personally and spiritually bruised and battered. And we would love God to take the problem away. Now sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. Jesus did still the storm. But sometimes... He allows the problem to remain and enables us to carry on serving effectively and living positively in spite of it. When he does that, when he does that, how do we feel about it? How do we react to it? Let me wrap up by giving you a few pointers from the way Paul reacted to his thorn in the flesh. Firstly, we may or may not always understand why. Now, Paul did come to understand why. He realised that his thorn, whatever that was, was allowed by God to prevent him from becoming proud because of his remarkable spiritual experiences and visions. But we may not always know why. God doesn't take this serious problem away from me. 
In which case, we just have to trust that if God allows this thorn in the flesh to stay there, it's because he wants to do something in us that will bring about a greater good for us and for other people. We may or may not always understand why. Secondly, we need to understand we can still serve effectively. Paul, at first, seems to have thought his ministry will be impeded, will be limited by this thorn. He came to see, no, it won't. No, it won't. Whatever may be your thorn in the flesh at the moment, it does not mean you cannot serve Jesus effectively this week. You can. You can bear good fruit for God's glory today. And then thirdly, we rely on God's grace. My grace is sufficient for you. You may think you need to be free of all your troubles before you can live effectively for Jesus. No, you don't. You don't need to be free of troubles. You need to be full of grace. You need to be filled with God's grace. That is more than enough to enable us to serve fruitfully for the glory of God. His grace may sometimes take the thorn away. And sometimes may make your Christian life even more effective even while the thorn is still there. And so that leads to the fourth thing, which is that we allow God's strength to work through and in the midst of our weaknesses. His strength in us does not mean that we stop being weak. Grace does not turn Christians into superheroes. We are still weak human beings. Grace means that Jesus can do positive and effective things through weak people like us. Not that we stop being weak. But that he does great things through weak people, like me. And finally, I think it's final, isn't it? <laughs> yes, finally. We stay positive in the midst of our weaknesses. Oh boy, that's a challenge. It's one thing to be positive when everything's going well. That doesn't take a lot of faith. But Paul says in verses 9 to 10, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He does not mean I enjoy suffering. He doesn't. Nobody does but what he means is, I don't see those things as something to be embarrassed by, something to be ashamed of, something I need to be limited by. I am delighted that God can do wonderful things through me, even in the midst of my difficulties. When I am weak, when I am painfully aware of my human inadequacy, vulnerability. That is when the power of God can work most effectively in me. So, if you are struggling with a thorn in the flesh of any kind, question for you. What do you want God to do with it? Take it away? Okay. Not a wrong thing to want, but suppose he doesn't. Suppose he doesn't. He didn't for Jesus in Gethsemane. He didn't for Paul. Suppose he doesn't. 
Are we going to put everything else on hold until God eventually removes this bull? Or are we going to say, I am ready for you to say to me, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm going to trust that your grace is sufficient for me. And therefore, I am going to carry on doing whatever you call me to do for Jesus. And if I hobble along doing it, then I will hobble along. So long as Jesus is glorified. It takes faith to pray for great difficulties to be removed. But it also takes great faith to say, Lord, if the difficulty doesn't go away, I'm going to serve you anyway. Because your strength, it can be made perfect in my weakness. May God give us both kinds of faith. Because sometimes we'll need one and sometimes we'll need the other. My grace, said God, is sufficient for you. Amen.